Hey, thank you, colleague Rebecca Burgess. And thanks everybody for joining today. My name is Jeff Gedman with American Purpose. It's my pleasure and privilege to welcome Tom Wright, who needs no introduction, but deserves an introduction. He leads the work at Brookings, uh, focused on European studies. He has a broad remit and range, which is really global as a scholar, as a public intellectual, as a writer. So thank you, Tom, and your busy schedule to make time. It's a pleasure to see you. Thanks, Jeff. No, it's really great to be here. Thank you. Th thank you, e even if it's virtually and someday let's get this group together in person. And congratulations, Tom, on your new book. It is written, it is co-authored with Colin Kahl. It is a 2021, August 2021, St. Martin's book, Aftershocks, Pandemic Politics, and the End of the Old International Order. It's a fantastic read. We're gonna to talk to Tom about the book. I'm gonna lead, if I may, in asking questions the first 20 minutes or so, but then we wanna hear from all of you. There's a lot of expertise on the line today. So we'll open it up. 20, 25 past the hour. We'll have a hard stop at 1 p.m. Eastern. So again, welcome, Tom. Welcome, everybody. And let's just jump in. Tom, <clears throat> tell us first a word about your co-author, if I may, and tell us a little bit about your professional relationship, uh, what he's doing now and why he's unavailable to join such conversations and how you two came to the topic and timing. Sure, um, and thanks again. It's really great to, to be on with, with everyone and uh, I see many sort of friends in the participants list there and uh, and so look forward to the conversation. So yeah, it's a co-author book with Colin. We've known each other for a while now, I guess since probably about 15 years or so when he was um, um, sort of political scientist and working on Iraq and other um, issues and we both wrote pieces early on in the pandemic, um, me for the Atlantic and him for War on the Rocks on sort of the geopolitical impact of it. And Colin asked me if I'd be interested in writing what we thought would be a sort of a short book, you know, expanding on those essays. But as we sort of talked about it, we realized what was really missing and what was likely to be missing um, was a, a sort of an analytical narrative about what COVID was telling us about the world we're living in. Right, lots of people were writing why COVID over the long term would, you know, would uh, vindicate, you know, their prior views. You know, if you thought the world was going to become more cooperative, you probably thought that's what where COVID would lead, or or more competitive, um, and the like. And um, but we really wanted to focus on um, how the world was responding or failing to respond to this global crisis in an age of nationalism, you know, and rivalry. And so we, um, you know, we benefited enormously from just extraordinary investigative reporting that was done by newspapers all around the world on every aspect of the crisis because it was the biggest story in the world, obviously. So there was just amazing sort of resources available from one's own, you know, home office and um, to look into this. Um, so we benefited from that, and we also uh, try to do a lot of interviews with officials, including with Trump administration officials. Um, Federal Reserve, ECB, Europe, Asia, um, and we talked to those officials throughout the year, right? So we talked to them in the sort of late spring for the first time, and then again over the following sort of 12 to 15 months or so. Um, and uh, that was sort of a very sort of interesting process. And we try to sort of tell the, not the hidden story, but we, we did try to tell um, uh, stories that weren't sort of previously known and to try to dive in with some context, context, you know, why did China respond the way it did? What was sort of the deal with the Trump administration's response? What happened at the WHO? Colin, as you mentioned, you know, obviously, um, you know, had worked for Biden in the past. So we, we sort of knew that it might be a possibility that if Biden won the election, he might go back in. You know, he did, he had a, he had a, obviously a difficult confirmation hearing but one um, side effect of that for us was we had more time to finish the book, you know, so we actually finished the final, final, final edit that went to the publisher for printing sort of the day before he was um, confirmed. And so he, of course, 
is not allowed to have any role in the book after his sort of confirmation. So he's not sort of, he's under Secretary of Defense for Policy. So he's not sort of engaged in book promotion or anything like that. But we were we were sort of fortunate, I guess, that we did have the time to, to finish the, the book. And we, we just, if anyone's interested in terms of the process, we each took the lead on different chapters and then worked on each other's chapters. But I think it worked quite well because we both came at it from slightly different angles. And so the result hopefully is quite a global book. You know, it, it deals with China and the US and Europe, but it also deals with Bangladesh, Peru, Bolivia, you know, many parts of the developing world, India. Um, so we try to tell the global story really of 2020. Um, and hopefully, um, you know, hopefully we, we managed to sort of weave some of that together. So Tom, thank you very much. Um, I've enjoyed the book, uh, Kindle version on my iPad. I'm sorry, you all, that I don't have a physical copy to hold up. Do, do you have, it's inelegant of me to ask the author, but Tom, do you have oh. one there that you could hold up so we can see the I cover? Somewhere. <laughs> I, will, I, will, I will find it. Yeah, I have okay, it. So don't... There you go. <laughs> so th there we go. Sorry about that. That was inelegant of me, but I appreciate that. And you all, I'm, it's a. I'm told you shouldn't position the book, you know. Um, I'm told you shouldn't position your own book right behind you. So that's why it's slightly off to the side. Well, well, you you were known for elegance and humility, and uh, and so that was very nice that you needed to step away and look for it <laughs> rather than preposition. But my fault for not having a physical co physical copy. So so a, a word, a further word about methodology before we dig into the content. You did say that you two conducted a range of interviews. I think you say in the book 60 or roughly 60, 60. Could, could you give us a sense of the kinds of people uh, with whom you were speaking and in what countries? Just, just a, a snapshot yeah. at least. Yeah, um, sure. So, um, I, I definitely US officials, like Trump administration officials. It was a little bit, I wouldn't say it was challenging, but we were aware, obviously we were both critics of President Trump and both had written, you know, extensively sort of on us foreign policy. So we did uh, really want to communicate to those we wanted to speak to that we were, we wanted to be as objective as we possibly could be. And we wanted to sort of tell the story of you know, obviously there were there were lots of incidences and and um, and mistakes that were, were were made not just in the U.S. but elsewhere. We wanted to try to tell the different perspectives of the story. So, for instance, on the WHO, like what was it that the Trump administration's logic was on its position on the WHO? Why why were they sort of putting pressure in Geneva? And we wanted to talk to the WHO about how they sort of saw that. Um, and we I. I, you can be sort of the judge, Jeff, but we try to sort of tell that story a bit sort of dispassionately and objectively. Um, similarly, we may get into this, you know, there, there were um, uh, elements to which the Trump administration was actually earlier than other governments in realizing the threat posed by COVID. And so we wanted to tell as, you know, and if there was nuance there, we wanted to relay that. So I hope people who read the book even if they're um, sort of supporters of the Trump administration will find it sort of a fair assessment, you know, of, of their sort of thinking. Um, and we were fortunate to have um, cooperation by quite a number of Trump officials. I will say it be did become a little bit easier after the election, you know, than before the election, probably for obvious reasons, not just because Biden won, but I think because it was so political um, and, you know, and the whole context was so political, it was probably difficult to get some of those interviews before. In, in Europe, um, you know, uh, France, Germany, the UK, the EU, uh, in Asia, you know, um, Australian, Japanese officials. We did have a problem in China, obviously. There were various roundtables with, you know, um, sort of semi-officials in China, I guess. but. For the most part, not not organized by us, but just that some of us were participating in, but we didn't get a chance to talk to Chinese officials. And had we, obviously, I don't think they would have told us very much. So most of that is sort of open source. But we did talk to a lot of U.S. embassy officials in Beijing. So we talked in the book 
to civil servants who ran the public health team in the embassy. And we talked to other sort of senior officials, political appointees. We try to figure out, and not just in the US embassy, we try to figure out you know, the story of January from talking to them. So that, that was just, that might give you a flavor of the type of people. And in the WHO as well, we talked to officials there too. And it was all on condition of background. So, um, you know, we did sort of have multiple sort of sources for what we say in the book, but there are parts of the book that are more sort of reported um, based on those conversations. But that is very helpful, that flavor, Tom. We're going to come in a moment to what is it that's breaking down and also what is it that you and your co-author propose to do work in repair and reform. But, but first, let's go back to President Trump. And as you observe in the book, he, he's important, his approach to allies, to adversaries and to politics generally. Can, can you tell us because it has to do with how the pandemic has been managed early days in any case and to the larger subject of your book C can you tell us a little bit about how you characterize the person and role of donald trump in this story how you two assess and how you think he'll be assessed in the next years ahead yeah you know you you, you could fill an entire book with just embarrassing things that President Trump said about COVID. Um, but we tried not to do that, actually. We, we, we made a deliberate decision early on um, not to sort of overdo his role, you know, because we felt that, you know, with the regular press conferences, and, and we mentioned some of it, but we felt you, in, in a way that sort of obscures the story, right? Because just the volume of what he said and, and, and the various contradicting contradictory things he said over the course of 2020 on COVID um, is just way too large. Um, and it sort of, it did obscure that larger narrative. So here, here's the narrative we sort of tell about the Trump administration. Um, early January, a number of key officials in the administration uh, realized almost immediately that COVID is a major sort of national security threat. Part of this is happenstance, you know, um, Matt Pottinger, who uh, I'm sure uh, most people on, on the call are very familiar with, you know, have been a reporter at the Wall Street Journal during SARS in China, covered that story. Um, it was a formative period for him. You know, his wife worked at the CDC, his brother works in infectious disease. So Pottinger was sort of primed to be worried about this at an early stage. Redfield and Fauci were involved, O'Brien sort of followed suit. And so you did have a group within the administration that in mid-January was quite concerned about it. And that actually is a big contrast to Europe where you didn't really have that similar level of concern or in the UK um, at, at similar levels. And they persuaded Trump to impose a travel ban, on partial travel ban on China. That group saw that as the very first step, right? They believe this is 1918. In the book, we call them the 1918 faction. They wanted to build on that in February. But after Trump imposed the travel ban, his view was, um, I have an election coming up. The economy is going great. I don't want to do anything that might disrupt that. And so the real mistake the Trump administration made was not on a failure to understand the severity of the crisis early on. It did. Um, and so the accusations about changes in the NSC meaning they were running blind, we, we don't give that much credence, right? We, we deal with that in some depth in the book. The real mistake they made was in February and it was not actually making the necessary investments um, on testing, on, on therapeutics, on critical medical supplies. Um, some major mistakes made on the exclusion of the FDA from the COVID task force, some you know, mistakes made in the CDC. Um, so February is sort of the crucial month. When, when Trump then on March 11th shuts down the American economy, he has a moment where he realizes that this is really real, you know, that um, this is a major crisis. And for him, he sees it all through the prism of the election, you know, that Xi Jinping has messed around with him, that he's about to lose the election potentially because of this. And then he turns with a fury on China. And from that point forward, I would say, you know, um, it, 
it's more the story we sort of know, right? That he he's interested in repressing it early. He loses patience. He focuses on China. The defining prism of the of the administration becomes more COVID as emblematic of a China problem as opposed to a China problem and a global health problem. And so internationally, we we see more of a focus on pushing back against Beijing and less so on a coordinated. Um, sort of response. And then, of course, he sort of loses the plot then later in the year when he's sort of running around to these rallies, you know, and the like. But I think, Jeff, that early period is sort of still somewhat sort of misunder misunderstood. And, and I think it is those sort of crucial five or six weeks um, that mattered that mattered the most in, in that February period. Um, thank you. Um, th there are many reasons why I appreciate and admire the book. And I would say, in my view, for those of you who have not yet had the pleasure of reading it, it is certainly granular and detail oriented and trying to capture an important moment. It's timely, it's relevant, but it also has this feel, Tom, that you're endeavoring, I would say succeeding, by the way, in stepping back and trying to read larger trends and identify trajectory. So in that context, it tell us a little bit about the, this old international order. But what was that until recently? What was beginning to fray and, and how? And then there was this acceleration during Donald J. Trump and pandemic, but give us a picture of where we were and where in your view we've moved to now, setting the stage for big challenges ahead. Yeah, so what we mean by this, you know, and I guess to political scientists, it's a little bit provocative or to others, it's a little bit vague, but I think we mean something pretty specific, which is, um, the belief or our hope that major powers would come together in international institutions and then just informally to deal with shared threats. Um, and you can't really have an example of a more severe shared threat than an imminent ongoing major pandemic. And um, that that hope um, 2020 revealed, you know, was, was uh, without foundation, right? That we didn't see that type of cooperation, and we're unlikely to see it in the future because the lessons that are being drawn from this, particularly in China, I think, are not likely to lead China to agree to the levels of transparency and, you know, and cooperation the rest of the international community would want. And then even in our own countries, there's no guarantee we won't have leaders like Trump or Bolsonaro, you know, in the future. And so that notion of an international order that, you know, the, the US or, or sort of liberal democracies um, favor sort of cooperation, sort of naturally dominating or shaping the WHO. And, you know, there's a natural sort of leadership there that kicks in like in 08, 09 with the financial crisis, that that is sort of gone. And, and we can try to um, resurrect it um, and we can certainly work try to work with china and we should definitely remain members of the who and work within the who but we also need a backup plan to prepare for a scenario in which you know cooperation breaks down again so what do we do if we can't get cooperation from china or if we have nationalist leaders around the world what's our plan to deal with pandemics then and so it really is trying to take constraints seriously instead of saying let's just fix the world and be more enlightened you know, we really need to take seriously that this might be, um, you know, this might be with us for some time, not just the pandemic and threat of pandemics, but, you know, the type of world we're living in, the type of world that was revealed in 2020. So, so Tom, you, you write in an interesting way about relationships like Donald Trump and Angela Merkel, who leaves the scene now. You write about otherwise healthy democracies in Europe who, when pressed in a crisis, behaved in a way that advanced national interests, but not always, in my view, my words, not yours, the most decent, honorable, or international sort of way. I'm going to mention that to whet the appetite of the gallery. And before I turn to the gallery, 
for the benefit of those who have not yet read your book, could you tell us a word about how it's structured? I think it's structured in four parts, if I recall. Just lay that out for us, and then we're going to open it up to questions from our audience. Yeah, so it's it's structured in four parts. Um, part one um, is um, sort of the world before the pandemic. So we have two chapters actually on World War One and the Great Influenza and the geopolitical impact of that because um, it's really interesting history, I think, and also it sort of shows how these events can have a big contingent effect on, a, on, on, on the trajectory of world politics in terms of who gets sick, who doesn't, but also some of the underlying causes of future instability. Um, and so we tell that story and then we look at the world as it was on the eve of COVID and those sort of converging crises of you know, of, of geopolitical rivalry and, and nationalism and 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 globalization uh, pressures and globalization. So that's part one. Part two is sort of the national responses. We have a chapter on China that looks at the unraveling of post SARS cooperation, why China reacted in the way it did early on, um, and trying to tell some of those uh, stories I mentioned earlier that we got from interviewing officials and embassies and elsewhere to piece together. Um, that sort of failure of cooperation with the international community. Um, we have a chapter on the Trump administration uh, called, I think, Opportunities Lost, which tells a story I was recounting a moment ago, and also the relationship between the Trump administration and the WHO. And then we have a chapter on Europe and Asia and the rest of the world and those responses. I'm happy to get into that uh, in the conversation part if there's interest. And part three looks at um, the crises that emerged after the public health piece. So we have a chapter on the Federal Reserve central bank response and the broader implications for the global economy. That's a good news story in a way. One phrase we kept hearing was correlation without coordination, that you had central banks responding in a correlated way, even though they weren't really talking to each other all that much. And um, that's a sign of things working and being more resilient. I think the Trump administration deserves some mention in particular, some credit on that. We have chapters on the pressures on democracy, on the developing world, on technology. And then part four um, is both on sort of the vaccines, vaccine development, where we are sort of in early 2021, the new role of the WHO and its conflict with China now over the origins report, and then on recommendations uh, where we sort of talk about, you know, this negative synergy between transnational threats and great power rivalry and the need to have a backup plan um, to sort of universal cooperation. Tom, thank you. So 1227 Eastern, the floor is open to questions and comments. Use the raised hand function or put your question in chat if you like, and then if I miss you, if my colleague Rebecca or Michael would bring to my attention uh, who's there, I don't want to look, overlook anybody, I'll be happy to call on you. Anybody want to jump in first round? Is anybody suspicious of this whole thing? Sorry, could you clarify? Is anyone suspicious about the virus and the vaccines and what Big Pharma is doing and where this is all headed, uh, or are we all accepting the official uh, narrative? Uh, and and could, could you, all of you, could you identify yourself, please, when you ask a question? Richard. Okay, thank you, Richard. Tom, do you want to reply? I have to my that? arm up. Um, yeah, no, I'm not, you know, I'm not, um, suspicious, although I think one of the stories obviously is high degrees of suspicion in the US and around the world. I mean, to me, Richard, I think, you know, the one of the one of the most extraordinary um, triumphs of the pandemic was sort of cooperation between the pharmaceutical <clears throat> industry and governments on vaccine development. And if we were headed into the winter with Delta, with no medical countermeasures, you know, I think we really will be facing a worst case scenario when people are exhausted and tired. We have a much more contagious sort of virus with no sort of protection. I think that would have been very bleak. And so I think it is a, 
um, you know, it, it is sort of an extraordinary, you know, accomplishment. And there, I think, too, is one area where the U.S. deserves some credit for, you know, Operation Warp Speed. Um, but, you know, and now obviously the challenge is, you know, global vaccine distribution. Thank you, Tom. No, but I Richard. wasn't asking Tom. I was asking the whole group. I was okay. asking everybody in the group. Is there anybody that questions the official narrative? So either you, about Rod. the virus or the vaccine. So thank you, Richard. So what we're going to do, forgive me, but as moderator in my program, we're going to direct questions to Tom and to his book, uh, and then another day, another place, no, another time. So, and also you all, I'm using an iPad and if you're on the top row, I don't see hands. So Rebecca, help me. Anybody have a hand up for next question to Tom about his book? While we're waiting, Tom, I'm gonna ask you a question you and I were chatting about before we formally started today uh, in this subject of your book and this, shifting, ending, transitioning of the old international order, the United States is very important and, and China will be important and other countries too. C could you talk to us a little bit about Europe and Germany? Germany just had elections. Angela Merkel does exit the scene after a decade and a half. That's a substantial amount of time and influence. Talk to us a little bit about what you're seeing and expecting from Germany and from Europe in terms of compass and leadership, if you will, going forward. Yeah, I, I don't know if, um, Jeff, I, you know, you, you um, are more expert than me in, in, in Germany, so I'm probably not gonna be able to tell you anything you don't already know, but obviously I think, um, you know, I, I think it's sort of interesting, just it was a pretty, I, I know it was exciting by German standards, right? But it's interesting that, you know, you have a leader there for 16 years um, and, you know, the result of the election is a close election where her party, you know, almost is the largest party. Um, the actual winner of the election is a very centrist leader. I mean, not you know, party, I guess we can discuss, but Schultz himself, um, very sort of middle of the road, almost running as the heir, you know, to Merkel and you have a coalition outcome that seems you know, likely that the two options, obviously the SPD, you know, option is much more likely at this point, um, but those coalition options are broadly similar. So it's, it's, a, it's a real respite in a way from the more dramatic oscillations that we have in other countries. Um, Germany obviously has just come through this COVID, you know, crisis. And I, I would say just on the broader point of Europe, because I didn't have a chance to talk about that in the, in the, in the discussion so far, you know, this was a pretty horrific crisis for the European Union. Um, if you look at the overall number of fatalities, I need to check the latest numbers, but certainly quite recently, more uh, EU citizens have died than Americans. And when you adjust it for population, it was broadly um, similar. It was a crisis that really brought the EU close to not collapse, but they were thinking about the possibility of my collapse sort of early on. And that's what caused them to do the sort of big jump forward on fiscal integration. And just when they were very happy with having done that, they got complacent about having defeated the virus and it came roaring back in the fall and they fell far behind in vaccines. And now, of course, they've overtaken the US on it. So it's been a roller coaster ride for the EU. Um, and they're in a relatively positive place right now, although, you know, it's like I say, there could be a few more twists and turns, you know, in the future. I think the big sort of question is, and especially after Brexit, is can they now sort of use the lessons that they've learned from it to become sort of a more effective actor on the, in the public health, you know, space? And do they respond well to this crisis or do they sort of make new mistakes? Thank you, Tom. I have a couple. I'll go to Gary. Chris, and so on. Gary, shall I, happy to read your comment and question in chat, but our friend and colleague Gary Schmidt is there. Gary, do you wanna give voice to that? Well, I, I think uh, Tom just answered the question. So I was just asking about, I mean, the 
the tension between China and the U.S. is, you know, fairly predictable. I mean, you know, difference in the regimes uh, and different views about what the international order should look like. Whereas, at least on the face of things, the EU and the U.S. and the U.K. Uh, are more or less on the same page. Um, but the pandemic uh, and then the economic crisis afterwards um, shows that there's kind of a mixed picture about that. But again, you've you've kind of talked about this already, so feel free to, you know, say something more or say something and move on. Gary and I, he didn't mention, we were actually, one of my last trips before the pandemic was with Gary to Taiwan for um, the, the elections just before the pandemic, which I've sort of thought about a lot since, you know, that you had this quite amazing response by Taiwan early on in the crisis. They, of course, are one of the first, you know, to, to realize it and to try to warn the international community and it sort of didn't really cross my mind I mean, we did talk about public health actually when we were there and how important it was for taiwan to play a role um but i guess none of us sort of realized how, how serious this would get at that time which is early january but but that, that's sort of a tangent just on gary's question i guess all i would add on, on it is this you know it's important not to forget how frightened and completely obsessed by the domestic crisis where leaders were in that early period. And so Angela Merkel gives a speech at the start, all the leaders are giving speeches and she doesn't mention Europe or the international community once. It's all about this historic crisis in Germany. You know, in the UK, Boris Johnson, I think is distracted early on because Brexit actually happened on January 30th, I think 2020. Um, and so he was trying to say times are good, we're turning the page. And, you know, this, this um, pandemic was looming. And they, of course, experimented with herd immunity early on, which everyone, including the Trump administration, thought was crazy. So you just really didn't have, I don't know if it would have happened with a different configuration of leaders. It probably would have, I think. Um, but overall, you just had all of these leaders uh, really in survival mode and trying to cope with this overwhelming crisis that they really had no preparation for, despite, you know, everyone having predicted that a pandemic could happen, you know, at some point. And it did become sort of a point of division. And then with scarce resources and medical supplies, you know, we saw those competitive instincts kick in. And even within the EU, you know, countries were nationalizing equipment and taking it from each other or hijacking it effectively on runways and paying more over the odds for supplies of, of masks and other things. So, yeah, I think it really did drive a wedge in a way that was surprising in that early period. Gary, thank you. Tom, thanks very much. I want to go to Chris and Chris X on the screen. And Chris, if you would introduce yourself, please. Hi, I'm Chris. Uh, no, no, um, and I really like the topic and uh, the presentation Tom had today. So I have two questions. Um, so first one, um, just from your perch, right, uh, Tom, no matter you know what caused it and how it happened, given our situation today, right? between the post-COVID uh, recovery and the energy crisis that's created because a lot of countries have shifting energy from traditional to clean energy um, on their plate. And that definitely caused them short-term pain, right? Um, because it's gonna raise the energy price um, you know, in the short term, because we don't have the infrastructure to wrap the clean energy up. Who do you think right now is in the most optimal position between, between the Europeans and Americans and China and the rest going forward. Did you have a second question, Chris? Oh, I, I wasn't, I was gonna, oh, the second question, um, <coughs> but just part of the leave was the first one because I'll probably take up too much time for everybody. Hard to just stick with the first one. Okay, so, yeah. so let's take the first one and I'm gonna get others in, Chris. And if exactly, time, exactly. We'll come back yeah, to that'd you. Be, that'd be fair. Yeah. That's kind of you. Tom. Yeah, um, no, it's a, great, it's a great question. And I, I don't have a, you know, I, I don't think any of us really know, but my sense of it is this. I, I, think, I think this is a bad pandemic for China. You know, I think it, it um, you know, obviously, you know, 
the fact that it originated in China, that they did make mistakes early on, um, and that it affected the rest of the world in a pretty severe way, and there's still a sense that they're not cooperating, and that they overreacted them with an assertive foreign policy, I think has just done, you know, tremendous sort of damage to their soft power, and not just to their soft power, I mean, it, you know, they should have been able to drive a wedge between Europe and the Trump administration and the opposite happened um, in 2020. And so I think they hugely overplayed their hand. Um, I think that they also are making a bunch of decisions after the pandemic in terms of relative isolation from the world and being more closed off. And, you know, Xi Jinping seems emboldened and empowered in ways that I think will be destabilizing for world politics, but also will sort of hurt Chinese power as well. So I think on all of those things, you know, they feel it, it looks like they're very confident and assertive at the moment, but I think um, it's been a bad sort of pandemic for them. I think, you know, Europe and the US, I think have, you know, a, an ability to sort of recognize mistakes and to correct course, which I hope, you know, has happened here, obviously, with the election. Um, I think some of the successes and vaccine development, keeping the economy afloat, you know, leave, leave them sort of fairly well, you know, positioned. But I do worry about the long-term effects, you know, of, um, uh, you know, of a continuing COVID, you know, the way in which not enough may be done globally and what sort of lock in sort of a two-tier, you know, international order and then um, also the partisanship here surrounding pandemics, which I think was a surprise to me and is, is quite sort of concerning. So everyone has their challenge um, and, and the pandemic was a hugely tragic event in terms of fatalities in Europe and the US. Um, but I do think sort of looking ahead, you know, we have a lot of agency about where we go from here. And I think that's important. So thank you, Chris, and thanks, Tom. On agency and where we go from here, and if we could stay, Tom, if I may, with China for a moment. If, if we invited you back to give a talk uh, called Getting China Right, and for purposes of this conversation, I'm going to overstate for effect and say, on one side, we have the integrationists, and on the other side, we have the hard decouplers, and then from a US perspective, we need to navigate Europe too. Some capitals having different threat perceptions and some capitals having interesting assessments today about US power and purpose. Could you give us a little bit of a, your current thinking and a roadmap out of the work in the book? And then as you, public intellectual and writer about such things. Yeah, I, I think that I think we're in a very um, sort of, I mean, dangerous might be the wrong word, but I think we've entered into a new phase, you know, with with China. And I think, you know, in a way, 2020, if we are in a new Cold War with China, and I don't, I don't know that we are, and I know that term is heavily fraught and the world is much more interdependent and it's not the Cold War for sure, but it definitely seems headed for greater rivalry. Um, if we are in a new Cold War or something like it, historians may say that it started in 2020 in much the same way that, you know, they date the start of the Cold War to 1947, right? Because what happened in 2020 in terms of what it revealed about China and then how it basically um, consolidated a view in Washington around the need to push back in a more systematic way, starting with the Trump administration after March 11th and then continuing with Biden I think that is a critical moment, right? And that's not just an acceleration. It is obviously something of an acceleration, but how these things unfold matters. And I think it shows that we're in a, um, a much more contested world where it's hard even to put cooperation and competition into different compartments as a lot of people you know, would like. And this year, we're sort of seeing a China that is really no longer shapeable, is more isolated from the world, more assertive, I'm less willing to cooperate. You know, the Biden administration is reaching out to engage diplomatically and is being rebuffed on that because China is insisting on conditions for cooperation. And the folks I talk to, I'm sure, like other people on the call, don't really expect that. The people who look at this closely 
don't expect that to change the side of the 20th party Congress, right? And, and, and thereafter, who knows, you know, it's unlikely there'll be a major tack back toward cooperation. So we are, I think, headed into a more long-term competition, still having to deal with these transnational threats. And I think it has, you know, an ideological dimension to it. Um, it has, uh, you know, a, a real politic dimension. China itself is changing pretty quickly as we're seeing with the crackdown in the business community over the last two months and the major changes there this year. Um, so I think we're into a different, we're into a different world. And, and I think we need, you know, transatlantically a cooperate, a, a, a discussion on what that really means. I think AUKUS recently, the, the US, Australia, UK deal was sort of a sign how the US focus is shifting and that will have real consequences. It's a necessary shift, but it will have real consequences. So I hope, um, Jeff, that we will be, you know, we're only at the very beginning of this, and I think it will be a fairly unstable period initially because everyone's trying to figure out what the real red lines are and different interests are. And so I think we have a huge amount of work to do to unpack it and to try to put some shape on it and then to be able to manage it, you know, responsibly, as responsibly as we can. Thank you, Tom. Um, no hands up at this moment. So if I may, I go back to Chris. If Chris, you are still there. And if you have your second question in hand. <laughs> yeah, I'm very lucky. Yeah, this is great for me. Uh, so actually, I'll just continue on the topic with China. So this is probably for both Jeff and Tom, right? And uh, could the future of our, of our strategy um, you know, against China be something similar from our playbook against the Soviet Union with a slightly different twist. Because at the end, you know, we just really basically spent the Soviet Union into bankruptcy, right? I mean, that's, that's really what defeated them at the end. It wasn't like any kind of military engagement. Uh, they were just their economy couldn't sustain this level of spending against the US uh, and the allies. So, um, Given China is so reliant on this six to seven percent, that's the magic number, right? For the last 30 years, they had to grow six to seven percent every year to sustain their entire financial model, you know, to bring in foreign investments, to justify their rating, their rebound ratings, um, and to keep our spending. But now, currently, you know, was there what I call like a house of card finance kind of, you know, collapsing a little bit, right? Because so much of money is linked into real estate owned by the SOEs, the state-owned enterprises. Um, and, and the COVID really put a lot of pressure on that uh, because these bonds get called, right, you know, uh, in this kind of uh, environments. Um, and they're an energy-dependent and, and, and food-dependent country, right? They import tremendous amount of meat and, and gas into the country. They don't produce it. So if we just sustain a you know, um, nominally friendly formulation, but with tremendous pressure economically, will we say that's really the safest way to go versus any kind of like, you know, tough talk, you know, from a, a military and diplomatic point of view? Because I just don't see how their financial model is long-termly sustainable because the economy is not innovation and and service base is really still tremendously like finance and real estate based. Um. Yeah, thanks Sam for the for the question. It's a, uh, really interesting. I mean, look, I think people have been predicting, you know, the coming collapse of China, a real decline in the Chinese economy for some time, and it's proven to be fairly resilient. They have made major you know, uh, jumps forward on, on key technologies and on other aspects. And, you know, we're seeing obviously a very unusual, what well, seems to me anyway, to be a pretty unusual crackdown. And one would think sort of killing the golden goose a little bit in terms of what Xi Jinping is doing. But I, I wouldn't bet against, you know, the regime in terms of it coming out of this it, still in a strong position as, as foolish as it seems you know, to many of us, like, I don't think we can count on, you know, their sort of economic decline, even though I agree, you know, that they have, you know, vulnerabilities. I, I think I, 
even though I think we may say it has similarities in some aspects to a Cold War, again, as opposed to the Cold War, uh, there are big differences, right? I, I mean, everyone always points this out, but it's still, you know, needs to be pointed out the levels of interdependence and of interaction, not just with the United States, but with other third party countries, um, the degree to which China's integrated into the international order, all of these present unique challenges. I think it's certainly within the Biden administration, I think they're coalescing around a pretty clear, you know, policy, um, you know, obviously allied focused, you know, pushing back. They've got some big gaps to it on the economic trade side in particular, I think is one um, that I think they know they need to do um, a lot of work on. Um, but the, you know, the challenge is going to be, you know, to have sort of a balanced approach to, to be able to deal with these transnational threats without Chinese cooperation, to be able to, you know, work with allies that have strong economic partnerships with China, and then to be able to deal with what Xi Jinping, you know, does sort of internationally in the dilemmas that they will impose on us. So I think it's a very challenging period. There are lessons, I think, from the past, but I think there's going to be a lot of novelty as well. So uh, Tom and Chris, thank you very much. Chris, thanks for widening our lens and being with us today. We're into now the last minutes of today's conversation. I don't want to call on Larry Haas. And Larry Haas, great to see you. Thanks for making time. Thanks, Jeff. Nice to be here. Uh, Tom, I wanted to ask um, about the international order from a different perspective. Um, because when I think about the international order, I think about it from the early days, actually, of the Cold War. So it's the internet, it's the liberal international order, US led uh, succession of, I would suggest, enlightened or at least cooperative presidents who and congresses that extended it. Um, I think the subtitle of your book has to do with the end of the, of the international order. You may not mean it in terms of the liberal order, um, but, uh, and I haven't read the book, so I apologize. But I'm just wondering, to the extent that you see the breakdown of the U.S.-led order, and you see it as, uh, as a, you know, a, a long-term feature of the future based on what we saw with uh, COVID. Um, I wanna get a sense from you as to uh, whether you think it has to do with exhaustion uh, at the grassroots level, uh, particularly in the United States, but maybe in Europe as well, if it has to do with, for whatever reason, uh, a new generation of leaders that don't buy in. Um, are we perhaps in a period where perhaps, you know, maybe we'll get over this and get back to what a lot of us would think would be more productive US led leadership around the world. So, you know, I know predictions are hard, particularly about the future, but um, I'm just wondering if you could give me your sense as to, you know, how long term of a feature you see this new era as and what the major reasons is are based on what you saw with COVID. So, so thanks, Larry. And if you'd hold your fire, Tom, for one moment, I do want to get Fritz, Fritz Heinsen in so we don't lose your comment or question and uh, time is racing. Fritz, can I give you the floor and then we'll give Tom a chance to reply to both. Okay, very quickly. Um, the, the opportunities for radical, or not opportunities, incentives possibly for radicalization. I'm, I'm very curious about that. You have economic disparities that have increased during the pandemic, medical disparities, distribution of, of uh, medical resources, and so on. And then I've just read an article that was, wow, they just said hard. How many orphans alone are being created? I think the figure was in the article was something to the 1.1 million so far. So you start to add up all these different factors around the world. The, the Peru was the worst example on the orphans. So we've got South America, Middle East, whatever. Let's cover the globe. What are the chances we're going to see maybe millennial notions or other apocalyptic notions, radical Islam, whatever, radical, more radicalization at a time in which the US and others are, are maybe stepping back and having less influence so I'd be curious your thoughts on that, please. Thank you. So Fritz, thank you. And, and Tom, um, 
gosh, those two questions, why don't you take 45 <laughs> minutes to an hour and yeah. uh, have at it? Thanks, and, and thanks guys. I'll, be, I'll try to be very quick. So just two, um, two um, responses to the first question, to Larry's question on the international order. So we mean something pretty specific by it, which is, you know, that this is the end of expectations that the major powers will all cooperate on these shared issues, on these shared challenges, right? And that so uh, the US and China and Europe, it's going to be very difficult to, to um, ensure and then sustain high levels of cooperation on pandemics or climate change or other threats and challenges in the future. And that does create a different world than the one that was expected for much of the post-Cold War period. I think on the national issue, what you mentioned rightly about sort of exhaustion of playing a leadership role, I guess one big question that I have, and this gets more to the China piece than the pandemic piece, but is, you know, do Republicans in particular who have been skeptical of the sharing of sovereignty and multilateralism, do they get reinvigorated behind greater international cooperation as a necessary tactic to respond to China's rise? You know, do you see like re-engagement in international institutions to compete with China, to prevent their candidates from being elected, to preserve sort of the norms of liberal democracy in those institutions? Um, there was some of that actually at the end of the Trump administration, you know, the World Intellectual Property Organization was one where they did contest sort of Chinese leadership and did sort of organize. And so I think that's one big sort of question, does geopolitical rivalry, you know, reinvigorate the need for multilateral cooperation in the same way that maybe it did, you know, in the 40s and 50s? Um, and then on the on the other question, on, uh, on Fritz's question on, on um, radicalization, look, I, I think there will be lots and lots of, of unknown consequences to you know, this pandemic. Um, just to mention one, um, which is not one you mentioned, but it's one I've been looking at pretty closely that's not in the book, but we have travel rules now which basically divide the world into safe and unsafe zones. And we do that for public health reasons, and that's you know defensible, but it also cuts along socioeconomic, geopolitical, and even ethnic lines. And we could easily end up with sort of turbocharged global inequality um, that I think could have significant repercussions you know, down the road. And I think a big question leaders have to ask themselves is do we want to get back to some version of the way it was? And if we do, what are we willing to do to do that? I mean, do we treat the global vaccine piece of this as the latest front in a global fight against COVID? Or do we see it as foreign assistance and development and sort of things that should be paid for, commensurate with what we've paid for in the past. Um, obviously, I'd be in favor of the former approach, you know, but I do think we're at risk of losing something. And I think what could flow from that are, you know, political movements and ideologies and developments, you know, that would, I think, cut against our, our interests and values. So, Tom, thank you very much. We're a minute and a half for the hour, 1 p.m. Eastern. I want to keep our guest of honor on time and all of you who are kind enough to make time for this conversation today. Um, th this, from my perspective, is as good as it gets. It's such a well-spent hour to have such a smart conversation with a wonderful conversation partner about an outstanding new book. Tom, again, congratulations to you and Colin. To all of you, as a reminder, the book is called Aftershocks, Pandemic Politics and the End of the Old International Order, August 2021. Tom, you were generous with time and uh, appreciate your clarity of analysis and candor. Tom, you have a last word if you like, and then we'll say goodbye to everybody, inviting folks, if you wish, to turn your cameras on. How about that? Tom, over to you for a final parting word. Jeff, thank you so much. I, I don't have anything to add except to say thank you. This is a wonderful conversation. I really enjoyed it, and uh, I look forward to staying engaged. I'm sure there'll be, um, uh, unfortunately, this pandemic will probably be around for a while, um, internationally at least. But thank you again. It's really terrific. 
Thank you, Tom. Thank you, everybody. Have a good and safe afternoon, evening, more soon. All the best. Thanks. Bye.